Dwayne Thomas came in and saw me yesterday afternoon at approximately 6.30 and advised me that he was reporting to the Cowboys. At the same time, he had requested reinstatement from the retired list to the commissioner of the National Football League. This morning, we advised the commissioner that Thomas had come in and reported. Uh, the commissioner advised us that he would attempt to facilitate the reinstatement as quickly as possible, but that he would delay any action until he received a report of Duane's reporting physical examination. Do you play a little better when you have a younger brother coming along who's blowing smoke right behind you? I don't know. I, it kind of makes me feel good to have a younger brother, but I don't think it makes me perform any better because there's always somebody back there blowing smoke. But it, it makes me feel good that I have a little brother that is doing good. How do you feel about your defensive line this year? I think we're going to have a, an outstanding defensive line. I don't, we're not going to be very big. I'm about 190, and Don Ely's 190. Greg Platts is 200, and, and uh, Ray Dowdy's about 215, and we'll average about 5, 10 and a half. But we'll be quick, and I think we'll be real good. Um, I felt there were a number of turning points, really, Jerry. Uh, of course, the goal which Atlanta scored in the, in the first half there was, had me a little worried for a time, but then when we equalized so quickly, I felt there was one turning point right there. In the second half, of course, we, we came out and uh, took it to them immediately. We lifted our game quite, quite a bit from the first half, and I felt that uh, this extra pace, if you like, showing a little bit more imagination than we did in the first half, uh, gradually allowed us to completely dominate the game until uh, uh, in the, later on in the second half. You know, I didn't think that there was going to be too much danger to us, really. I guess uh, enough cannot be said about Luis Girassi. No, no, indeed. Uh, this was another, of course, high point of the game for us. Luis came on, did a tremendous job tremendous job. Lewis is, uh, is an excellent player. He's a really, really good player. Of course, people tend to think he's you know, getting on a little bit now, lacking a little bit in pace, but he really makes up for that, and more so by his experience, his skill, and uh, uh, I think everybody tends to get excited even when he just receives the ball, you know, the anticipation of it. How will the game go now tomorrow night in Atlanta? It'll still be very hard. It's, uh, there's no doubt that the game last night must, must have taken something out of them, um, but equally it's taken something out of us, you know. For me, playoffs are entirely different games. Uh, they're nothing at all like regular season games. Uh, how great is your desire to win? I think this often becomes the focal point, and I know that we want this championship very badly indeed. Uh, nobody can guarantee a win, but I'll guarantee that we'll go out there and give absolutely everything we've got and a little bit more to win it.
made a vision for the next one over there. He said, for the kingdom, everything went smooth up through the lunch periods and then at the uh, approximate 12 o'clock time um, when youngsters would return to class there was a great deal of confusion and turmoil. Uh, youngsters of this age are very much suggestive to uh, uh, impulse and the feelings. Other youngsters had told them that uh, they were leaving at 12 o'clock and uh, at that time a large number of youngsters did leave and a number of youngsters who did not leave just picked up on the excitement and were just overly stimulated for that particular time. His basic humility in that he's a worldwide figure, but yet he's just a common man who just preaches a simple gospel of Jesus Christ. Well, about his sincerity and the, uh, the gospel that he preaches, a very simple story of truth, and that he's committed very much to it himself, and that he knows the truth of the, uh, of the change that it brings to a person's life. I can see God speaking through him. And this hasn't always impressed me this way, but until recently, I was at the crusade in Oakland this summer, and um, well, I can just see God speak to Billy Graham. Well, I think the simplicity, the one, the way he comes out with a real genuineness, which really Jesus had intended us to have, no superficiality at all, it's just, just him as belittling himself and bringing Jesus to the forefront. Well, I believe it's the simplicity in presenting the gospel the fact that he presents Jesus Christ as he is and the fact that it is our job as Christians to proclaim Jesus Christ in the simplicity and the realistic way that Jesus Christ really lived and the fact that he speaks to people as people. Well, I'm impressed with the way that Dr. Graham presents the gospel in its simplicity, in its authority, and with its power. I'm thoroughly impressed with the fact that he is so concerned and burdened about our area having a true spiritual awakening during this time. He spoke of the fact that although Christianity is strong in this part of the country, we definitely need an awakening and a reawakening through an spiritual experience. 
He also mentioned the fact of how the gospel has changed a number of people, regardless of their cultural background, regardless of the fact whether they're an intellectual, or regardless of the fact where they are, whoever they may be, or whatever they've been involved in, that the power, the simplicity, and the authority of the gospel of Jesus Christ is able to change them. Judge Sarah T. Hughes today issued an injunction against all of the defendants in the Securities and Exchange Commission's civil stock fraud case, in effect telling them to no longer violate the law as she found that they have done in the past. There are four defendants upon which the public attention has centered, Wagoner Carr, John Osorio, Frank Sharp, and Quincy Adams. Of those, Wagoner Carr was listed as having committed four violations, and each of the other three, five apiece. Sharp nor his attorneys were in court for the decision today, but we did talk with Osorio, Carr, and with Tim Timmons, attorney for Quincy Adams. I know that I'm not uh, guilty of what the SEC said that I was. Uh, I will uh, confer with my counsel, and we'll make a very early decision on appealing. I'm sure that we will because we know we're right. And as long as we know we're right, we'll continue to fight this thing to the very end. We will carry it to the Supreme Court as long as money will hold out. Mr. Osorio, you, you, you said that... I don't have any money. It all depends on my lawyer. You said it, at one time in your deposition, you're quoted as having said that Frank Sharp owns you lock, stock, and barrel. Could you explain that? Well, when a man uh, controls, uh, controls the Sharp Town Bank the way he did, and... Uh, I owed $550,000 to it, plus a million two hundred thousand, plus two million seven hundred thousand for the Dallas Bank and Trust. He pretty well owns your lock, stock, and barrel. Then did, did he use that to cause you to do the things that he wanted done? Well, that was that tacit understanding. You see. The evidence shows that at all times Mr. Adams acted only as a licensed stockbroker, handling actual and genuine sales and purchase orders in connection with his duties as a stockbroker. He was never a participant in any scheme that Frank Sharp either masterminded mind, or carried out. Consequently, we are of the opinion that the evidence produced by the SEC in this trial is totally insufficient to support the injunction granted. A number of defendants, particularly Wagoner Carr, maintained throughout that while they did enter into certain transactions, they were not aware of any violations of the securities laws. Judge Hughes said in her verdict that persons who control companies that are doing the public's business or are owned by the public through stocks have to know what is going on and have to be aware and have to make sure that they are aware because they have to be responsible for their acts. The state politicians who have been mentioned so prominently in connection with this stock scandal, of course, were not defendants in this case. There are other investigations going on of a criminal nature which could result in possible criminal charges against those public officials if the investigating bodies find that charges are warranted. However, we asked the regional administrator of the SEC office in Fort Worth, Gerald Bolt, why those politicians were important to the SEC's civil case. The securities involved uh, in this case uh, were also uh, the same securities that were sold to some of the figures that you mentioned. So they very definitely were relevant in the manipulative effort and in the sale of unregistered securities. And uh, moreover, we allege that it was a part of the scheme that the defendants in this action uh, were attempting to uh, improperly influence legislation in the state of Texas. And so the first chapter in what will be probably a long book, or perhaps even the first book in a long series of volumes in the great Texas stock scandal has been written. And while there was a lot of importance attached to this one, 
it really gets serious from this point on because the next chapters will involve criminal charges against some defendants. And that could mean fines, jail sentences, or both. This is Roger McDonald, Channel 8 News on the Move at the Dallas Federal Building. Oh, yes. Uh, these uh, are people that are already committed. They wouldn't be in seminary if they weren't already committed to some phase of the work of the kingdom of God. And uh, I try to be as practical as I possibly can, and I try to talk about some of the issues before the church today, and I try to talk about some of the practical things they're going to face as clergymen when they graduate from here, and also some of the habits and practices that they can engage in now, like uh, their devotional life and so forth while they're in seminary that will help them in their later life. The meeting ended uh, when we came down to the point where I informed Sheila Johnson, the spokesman for the group, that she would not be able to come to Thomas Jefferson. She, in a meeting yesterday, told me that no one could tell her what to do and uh, as a result of this, I did not feel that we could operate under those circumstances. That uh, she would need to go downtown and we would make other arrangements for her. As a result, she was angry. She lost her temper. The other members also went with her and uh, they left angrily hollering, uh, hollering back that we will overcome. Well, Don, I think our, our position is one of consternation at the moment. We have a board that is not functioning. We have a situation that is, is uh, very worrisome to us at this time in Dallas. It, uh, I've sat on corporation boards. I sat on a community action board for three and a half years myself. And an agency can't function with a board that doesn't meet. What are you going to do about it? Well, actually, it's not the regional offices position to do something about a board that we fund. It's up to them to work out their own problems. Now, a suggestion was made by two members of my staff yesterday to the elected officials in Dallas that a retreat of the entire board be held in another city besides Dallas, close, close enough to get to, with members of our staff in what we call a board training session, whereby we would send members of our staff to meet with the entire board in a closed session, not to have a board meeting, but to discuss the principles and the policies and the ideas and the things that can be done to alleviate poverty in Dallas. It is for Kunstler, it is not for anyone else. Kunstler is a radical. He fancies himself the 
spokesman for the what he calls the coming revolution. Uh, he, I knew him when before he uh, had his experience in the Chicago Seven trial that I think affected him. He doesn't know the difference between notoriety and fame. Once it could be a very capable trial lawyer, but he now is a crusader, and uh, his, he does not represent the bar. The thinking of the bar or the bench or hardly anyone, except a few radicals. I was on a program with him on a talk show not long ago, where he said, uh, "I will never represent anyone uh, that I don't love." That's to equivocate that with his estimate of Rockefeller or the authorities, why you have Kunstler. 